if I put 20% of my assets into Bitcoin and it fell down to 5,000, how am I going to feel? Traditional markets, they're trading in very small percentages. Bitcoin can trade in multiple percentage points per day on like a on like a boring day. And then there will be a fast move that will come and a lot of people will say, oh my God, why was I not on that move? And they've already missed it. What's up, guys? Welcome to our weekly crypto market updates. Today with us, two very cool traders, Eric Crown and Charlie Burton. Welcome, guys. Regarding the Bitcoin price, last Sunday we saw an abrupt drop in the Bitcoin price from uh, above 9,000 to the mid-low 8,000s. How did you explain? How did you explain this uh, sudden drop in uh, the Bitcoin price, guys? First, uh, Eric. Yeah. So uh, if I can share my screen really quick right here. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Bitcoin hit a pretty major, uh, pretty major area right here. The 200 simple on the daily, always going to be a classic uh, pullback area, you know, on your first pass and also hitting a very long-term trend line as well. So actually, let me just throw it in right here. Maybe, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, all kind of coinciding that same, you know, lower $9,000 region. So uh, Bitcoin likely to pull back off a region like that. And uh, now consolidated at a higher level, which I do think, you know, as long as we hold, especially uh, 8,300, more or less okay. Um, you know, the resiliency within this region is actually very reminiscent to me of the of uh, of what we were dealing with uh, about a year ago, actually a year ago to date almost. Um, uh, right in over here on this area, everyone was talking about the 50 simple moon average on the weekly coming in um, right around about 5,500. And uh, Bitcoin, you know, tested it a few times, pulled back. Everyone got really, really scared, saying that we're going to go back down because uh, that's what we rejected in 2014, 2015. Little, you know, little do people remember that uh, anytime, you know, you grind out a major area like this typically is bullish. So I do think that as long as Bitcoin kind of stays in this region right here uh, between and just kind of hovering and putting in another potentially higher low as it stands right now in the uh, mid 8000s, more or less OK. And uh, probably get another test back up to that 200 moon average somewhere around uh, low 9000, upper 8000 ish region. So Charlie, what's your take of this? What's uh, your take of the situation? Uh, did you follow the Bitcoin latest uh, price movements, like the drop on Sunday? Do you agree with uh, Eric's analysis? What's what's your take? I don't think that. I think those sorts of drops are just a natural phenomena within any any price market, actually. And any market when it's having a, a sharp move like we've just seen in Bitcoin. So any market that's going to have a good run like Bitcoin's had over just the last few, the first few weeks of January, they're going to be flush outs. And that's the main point that the market is constantly trying to flush out weak hands. That's just something that happens across any market, whether it's equities, Forex, uh, cryptocurrencies, whatever it might be. So I don't see anything in that. It's just a way of just stopping some people, some traders out in the short term, short term traders. But in the longer term, like Eric's just said, um, interestingly, Eric, in your your trend line you, on your chart, it's showing that um, your um, it's bashing its head against that trend line. Whereas on mine, we've already got a breakout there on my charts. Um, must just be a difference between the um, the. I would guess yeah. that you're probably using wicks rather than uh, bodies, as it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so. Um, so it's just the way the technical analysis is and different people look at things slightly differently. So um, I see this market. I was looking at this. Oh, fun enough, the last time I was on here, we were talking about this weekly chart here. This is the Bitcoin futures chart, by the way. That's why there's only so much data here. Um, but on the weekly chart here, we pulled back to the weekly 50. Oh, good, good two months ago now. And last time I think I was on your program, I was talking about the fact that this should be a decent support area. And it took a long time to get going, but it's finally getting going. So I think we can talk about that more in a, in a moment. But in the short term, those sorts of moves are just ways to cut out the, uh, the short term players and get them stopped out as far as I'm concerned. So Eric, uh, what do you think? Do you agree with the fact that this is just uh, weekends being shaken out? Yeah, it's no secret that uh, this market is very immature and uh, it's very over leveraged at times. We have 100x leverage, I mean, even up to 125x leverage now in Binance. Uh, so people getting a little bit frothy at the mouth after a nice, uh, what, like $2,000 run off the lows, um, likely to get shaken out, you know, on those positions. I, I think it's pretty damn classic and uh, very, you know, par for the course for Bitcoin. Uh, I don't really see anything too much out of the ordinary here. Uh, I don't really get uh, even medium term a uh, little bit shaky on Bitcoin as long as it's above about 82 to 8300 ish region and maintains that uh, that daily uptrend that we're looking at right now.
Can you maybe briefly uh, underline what is your outlook for the medium term, uh, Eric? For the medium term, yes. Yeah, medium term. I mean, we kind of just touched on it a second ago. Um, I'm looking for Bitcoin to kind of consult at a higher level as long as, it, again, as long as it holds this uh, 8,500 ish level, puts in another higher low on the daily right here. I think that it's going to actually give a nice breakout above that 200 simple and test likely around the next weekly high, which is uh, 9,500. That's where things actually get really interesting for me, though, um, because Bitcoin's weekly chart, Bitcoin's weekly trend in general has been has been your best friend, really. Anytime that we've had a, a reversal, a confirmed reversal on the weekly, those are your massive moves to the upside and to the downside. In this case right now, we're technically still in a downtrend on the weekly, uh, which does accurately represent the macro for Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, if we can get that next leg up, then I would be uh, be looking for a pretty, uh, a pretty strong outlook for, you know, at least the beginning, you know, half of uh, 2020 or whatever year that we're in right now. Um, as uh, that would probably open up the doors for a move back up into the five digits. And well, from there, we'll have to come back and uh, and reassess, but that would be more or less good and uh, really setting the macro uh, trend to the upside. Okay, um, Charlie, what do you think? What's yep. your take out for the for the middle term? I'll just put my charts up back up again. So yeah, on the weekly chart here, and I'm happy to use the weekly chart if you want to know the uh, the general trend. Um, I'm in agreement generally with uh, Eric there, but um, for me, this isn't actually in a bear. Uh, you can call this um, a, a bear trend from since last summer, but for me, this is just a pullback. I see this as just a pullback. It's a pullback to uh, typically to that weekly 50 moving average. It's held that weekly 50, um, and I do see the potential for this to run back up to 12,000 area. However, um, I think I said this. Uh, last time, I don't necessarily think that we're going to just keep going powering on from there. I still see the next year to 18 months. There's, there's just too many um, retail traders out there getting too excited, especially after last year and the early part of last year about Bitcoin. And I think it probably needs to form a range, a longer term range on the weekly chart to just bore some of those investors out there and just so that it just again shakes those investors off. So the way that I see this is that, yes, I do see some more upside coming over the coming weeks and months. But generally speaking, I think we'll have upside and then we'll have downside again. And um, it'll just to the point where a number of players will just get bored and move on. And then and then there will be a fast move that will come. And a lot of people will say, oh, my God, why was I not on that move? And they've already missed it. So um, but I still think this is good. this has got a long time to play out um, from a sentiment perspective, and the market has done a good job of shaking out a load of people, obviously in 2000 into 2018 and 2019. But um, but I think there's probably a different type of shakeout now. I think this is a accumulation phase, and for people who can just sit on it as investors, I think it's a great time to do that. But as traders, um, you've got to have a, a longer term view because otherwise you will just get shaken out. So okay. as far as I understand, uh, you both agree with, uh, with what Peter Brand said in our last video. They don't think it's time. They all now want to sit and buy a break at uh, back to 6,000 or 5,000 and they've missed the bottom. And uh, during that bottom, I think you had a lot of people accumulate who were strong hands. The weak hands are out, the strong hands own it. Yeah, so I, I can show a couple of fundamentals on this one actually that uh, speak to that point. So yeah, one of the things that re that really stands out to me here, um, uh, from a fundamental perspective, is the uh, is the hash ribbons, which uh, we've been following on my channel quite frequently for the last uh, for the last like month or two. And any time that we've gotten a buy signal on these babies, uh, Bitcoin, while it's it's not a good timing of momentum, it's actually pretty terrible at timing of momentum. It does accurately over the over the nine ten year history of Bitcoin always suggest not always suggest but always imply that the low had already been put in prior and on a daily closing basis. Bitcoin does not violate that prior low and just can just kind of like, you know, go back and verify this. You know, you get the buy signal right here. The low from from prior was in thirty one hundred. You know what? Again, terrible, terrible timing signal. But, you know, the momentum afterwards does, uh, you know, does continue upwards and onwards. Same thing right in over here. This one actually happened to be a pretty damn good timer. Uh, this one over here, again, low was in, you know, from prior over here. But <laughs> as far as timing goes, terrible. Same thing with this one, even worse timing. And same thing with this one. But again, the low was in. Bitcoin does not close lower on a, on a daily closing basis. Um, same thing over here. Actually, pretty good timer. This, these ones decent as well over here. And this guy right in over here. So we did get a buy signal. 
um, after the uh, 6400 low was put in, uh, what was it, like a month ago now? I, I think that was uh, middle of December. Yeah, a little bit more than a month ago now. And uh, I would think that that does, you know, that does hold true. I mean, we're talking about a, a, a piece of edge here that has, you know, nine, 10 iterations now. And uh, that's, you know, as a trader, I mean, that's 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 good enough for me. Um, doesn't mean that we can't come back down. And in fact, to Charlie's point, what he was speaking about earlier, you know, do we create a range uh, that's just absolutely devastating to day traders and just people in general and bores, bores the shit out of people? Very possible um you know because we could come back down to the prior lows but i wouldn't expect bitcoin to close below the prior lows just based upon that i do think that people got essentially front ran here i know that there was a lot of clout on like crypto twitter and whatnot people talking about you know six thousand five thousand and um i i think it would be very poetic if this market's uh if this market didn't give it to them charlie do you have anything to add do you think that we actually touch the bottom so again, coming back to the weekly chart, and I'll go back down to the daily chart as well. But on the weekly, there's a couple of areas of caution. I, I think that the, anyone calling for a price to go back down below 6,000 when it's already done a, a key test of a key level to me, technical level, if it was to come back down and breach that 6,500 area, I'd be quite concerned for the, um, certainly for the medium term of Bitcoin, that it could then start to search out 5,000 below. But I'm not necessarily expecting that. One thing I will say <clears throat> is that if you can see on my chart, this blue moving average, I've just got a few moving averages on a chart. I trade very simply. I've got a MACD down the bottom and some moving averages and then just technical uh, analysis um, goes on top of that. And this uh, 20 moving average that I have on here is still facing down. And quite often when you've got price moving in one direction, but a 20 moving average still facing down, then it's just a sign that the market could pull back a little bit. That's all I'm talking about in the short term here because it's a weekly chart. So until that weekly 20 can flatten off, there is the risk that uh, Bitcoin could just do another bit of a pullback. So if we go back down to that daily chart there, then there is the scope for a bit more of a pullback on the daily chart. But generally speaking, uh, the way I look at uh, Bitcoin here, technically since coming down to that weekly uh, 50 zone, I see no reason why it has to go back down there. So for me, if I was if I was technically trading Bitcoin right now and I wanted to be in, then I would just be looking at any little pullbacks as opportunities to get long. So that's how I see it. Um, I but certainly in the short term, looking at that weekly chart, there is the potential for um, a bit of a, a pullback, but only that would only be a pullback into again if I go back down to the daily charts. Well, it can pull back anywhere down to what, 8,000 area easily, even into the upper 7,000s actually, because that'd still be above its 50 day moving average here. So that's still technically bullish as far as I'm concerned. Um, so any pullback in that whole zone would be, in my view, a buy zone anyway. So I have no issues with that. Peter Brandt also said that uh, for everyone who is interested in trading Bitcoin, they should have at least 10 to 20% of uh, an ownership position into Bitcoin. Do you agree with this uh, analysis, Eric? Um, I'd, I'd have to uh, understand the specifics of what he's saying. Does this incorporate all different types of trading markets or is he just talking about cryptocurrencies in general? I have a strong amount of respect for Peter Brandt, so I'd imagine he's probably talking about all different markets, which I'd more or less agree with. Yep. Um, Bitcoin's an extremely volatile you know, asset to begin with, so I don't need all that much in it. Uh, traditional markets are, are very tradable right now. Forex is extremely tradable right now. Um, you know, 10 to 20 percent is is even it even would seem a little bit high on the on the higher end to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Do agreed. Agree? I would say five percent, but um, um, rather than 10 to 20. Five mm. percent. Yeah. Yeah. As an investor, Bitcoin is still um, the potential upside gains are huge in it. So you don't actually have to have 20 percent in something if you if there are big upside gains. 5%, you would still do very well. If you, we're talking about from a, an investment perspective, it's the same with um, traditionally people have always looked to invest into the likes of precious metals and gold. And yet the, you don't put 20% into gold. You put 5% of your entire portfolio maybe into gold. Um, you don't ever go too heavy. So um, I, for me, 5 to 10% max. But that's again, I think for most people, um, investing is a very personal journey. And you have to be able to say to yourself, if I put 20% of my assets in, into Bitcoin and it doesn't work out for me, how am I going to feel about that? And if you 
ask yourself these key questions, sometimes the, uh, the natural response, the natural answer will present itself and say, well, actually, no, because if I put 20% of my assets into Bitcoin and it fell down to 5,000, how am I going to feel? Ah, oh, actually, no. But if I had 5%, actually, I'd be OK with that. I'd probably still be able to ride that out. But 20%, maybe I'd start to get panicky. There's your answer. Mm -hmm. Eric, do you have anything to add to what uh, Charlie just said? I'd more or less agree. Um, even 10 to 20 percent, like a, uh, like like um, like Charlie said, is a little bit on the higher side, in my opinion. I mean, if you truly believe in Bitcoin and um, and what it's kind of setting out to do, um, you know, you really don't need all that much in it. And it seems to me a more uh, more risk than anything else. So um, I think, I, I, you know, I think any any anything around 10 percent is probably fine. Recently, the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, released uh, its own uh, options uh, contract for Bitcoin, which uh, have doubled in terms of uh, trading volume in the first week after launching, so, which is quite remarkable. Uh, do you guys trade Bitcoin options? And uh, if so, what role do these options play in your everyday trading activity, Eric? Yeah, so I have been testing out options on uh, OKX. I've traded options on uh, on other exchanges before, and I used to be a market maker in equity options. Um, so with regards to Bitcoin options, they're very interesting because there's actually a, a ton of uh, a ton of opportunity in them because really, and, and I'm thinking from the perspective of a market maker, there's really not a good model to price these things right now. So as a retailer trader, you know, you actually have a, you actually probably have one of the more decent advantages uh, in these guys right now. So, you know, for myself, um, it's not a huge part of my trading right now because I'm not really I'm not really sold on an exchange. I don't really think that there's any like really great options. In fact, CME seems to be like the only the only the only good option that you can really trust. Um, so what I'd say about that is, uh, you know, ideally it would be ideally it would be because I like to manage my risk with options. So, you know, if I need to cover a position, I'd much rather do it with options than just like, you know, taking a futures position or, or, or having like some sort of a static stop loss. It seems very uh, elementary to me. But, um, you know, if I if I could, yes, absolutely, I would. And uh, I've I, you know, I, I imagine it's just a matter of time before most exchanges kind of get their uh, get their things together. And uh, it becomes a you know a much bigger thing and uh, much more widely available. So at that point, you know maybe in like a year or two, I'll probably be fully into it. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're saying that right now there are not enough options for trading options uh, for you to get fully well, into it. Well, just the exchanges aren't that. I, I want to give CME some time to kind of figure their uh, you know get you know get some more people on and get some more. It's still really really small is what it is. That's that's kind of my point. You know, you want to give it a little bit of time to kind of prove itself. And as far as the other exchanges, like the OKXs, the Deribits, the uh, God forbid anything outside of that, maybe um, you know that has like operates off a web browser. Uh, I, it's 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 always a trust issue. Um, ideally, one day we'll have uh, we'll have like American style options for uh, for Bitcoin. That would be a massive advantage. For right now, it seems to me that all of the uh, options are settled European style. So that's a little bit less enticing to me as well. But um, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of time before you see these listed on all major exchanges, and that's really when. I'd, I think um, I'm going to feel much more comfortable getting involved in something like that. Charlie, do you I'm trade gonna, Bitcoin options? Yeah, I'm not going to have much to add to this because I don't trade options anyway. Um, the one thing I would say for retail traders out there, do they really need to be using options on something which is a, a fairly volatile at times market anyway, and then adding further volatility to it? Because the average retail trader doesn't necessarily use options in a hedging way. They're using, they're just buying straight calls or puts or whatever. True. So they're taking like a, a lot, of, take from. lot of risk there. So um, for me, I think it's it's probably not the right thing for most retail traders anyway. They're just going to, this is the faster way to block their accounts. So you're saying that now you're talking about unsophisticated traders that are not able to handle this kind of sophisticated financial products or is, is it? I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, most most investors out there are what I would call unsophisticated and have no business going anywhere you know, near some of the more sophisticated uh, products. Don't get me wrong, for people who know what they're doing, yes, absolutely fine. But there's a lot of people out there thinking, oh, great, I can get more bang for my buck. I'm just going to put a call option mm -hmm. on on Bitcoin here. And then Bitcoin goes and dumps 800 points very quickly, and then they just get wiped out. So um, for the average 
person, I would say it's probably not the right place to be um, in that market. Um, they don't need to be then averaging, uh, adding that extra leverage on that. So I would say probably not worth it. What's your take on this, on this Eric? Like for uh, since when you started handling these very sophisticated uh, um, financial products, uh, talking about your whole career as a trader? Yeah, it, we had a great saying on the floor of Arca and it was, options were created to be sold. And the thing is that most retailers look at options exactly as Charlie just said. It's like, oh, extra leverage for a lower price. You know, they, they treat it as a lottery ticket. Um, and, you know, it's, I, th I think there's also a great statistic that like 80% of options expire worthless. I, I think that kind of, you know, answers the question for most retailers because most retailers are only buying options to begin with. They're not, they're not selling them. They're not using it to cover, which in that case, if, if you do, if you do spend, you know, even just like a few months learning options, they become the, the way to cover, at least in my opinion, there's, you know, there's no better way, you know, using both time and also decay on your side. That's, that's, that's a huge advantage that you can have. Um, but the problem is that, as Charlie said, most people don't really see it in that same vein. They see it as like an extra way to get, you know, eke out even more leverage, which is uh, not really necessary on an asset that uh, already has 100x spot trading and trades, you know, in ranges of multiple hundred dollars sometimes per day. Uh, you don't really need that. So in the past few weeks, uh, um, an altcoin, Bitcoin SV, has been pumping quite remarkably. Um, doubling its price then it fell down again very abruptly now it's pumping again a bit um it all seems to be connected with uh, um, the lawsuit involving uh, dr craig wright and uh, his uh, claims to be the <clears throat> original inventor of bitcoin satoshi nakamoto and uh, his claim to have access to a big fortune of bitcoin have you been following this uh, uh, this issue what do you think about uh, uh, sv market movements eric I think for myself, it's more of a distraction than anything. I'm not interested in trading SV. I'm not interested in the, I'm not, I'm not interested in it as an asset. I'm not interested in the Craig Wright debacle. It seems like it's just another, another piece of drama of news to follow. You know, if you want to busy your day with stuff that probably isn't all that relevant, at least to me, um, you know, if, if, if SV does, does for whatever reason happen to be the real Bitcoin, as they say, uh, then I'll just happily go into trading that. But I'm not really an investor. I'm not really a hodler myself. So, you know, I'm happy to just trade whatever is trading the most. And right now, Bitcoin SV does not trade the most, does not have the most trading volume. And I'm not interested in trading something that's not very liquid and doesn't even trade on very many exchanges to begin with. Um, so I figured that one's just going to, you know, that one's going to sort itself out. I, I would have my doubts as far as its legitimacy, um, as far as the name of it, they, I, I would think that if it was a legitimate Bitcoin, my biggest problem is the name of it. You know, they need to, uh, they need to really figure that one out. You know, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision that doesn't really no, roll off the tongue if you want world domination. So, um, for me right now, man, it's a non-event, not really interested in it. And, um, you know, if it does happen to be something, well, I'll go on to trading that instead of Bitcoin. Charlie, what do you think about all this issue? Have you been following it? No, I haven't. So I've got nothing to say on that at all. So we might as well move on to the next one, though. Nothing to say on that. Okay. How crucial is uh, margin trading in your day-to-day -day daily uh, tr uh, trading activity? And uh, what's the main difference between uh, margin trading uh, crypto and margin trading other tra more traditional uh, kind of assets? Eric? Margin trading is imperative to my day-to-day -day trading. I mean, if you can't, if, if you're not trading on margin, you can't, well, you obviously can't short and you won't be able to play derivative products like futures, like options. So that would just destroy, that would destroy my model for trading right now. Um, and what was your other question? Uh, how, how is it different from uh, traditional markets? Yeah, exactly. Um, margin trading on Bitcoin is a little bit different from traditional markets because you get this insane amount of leverage, which creates these insane swings as people get shaken out left, right and center uh, from over from these over leveraged positions. There is absolutely zero reason why Bitcoin needs 100x leverage. In fact, it doesn't need it, it really doesn't need any leverage. It need, it, at most, it maybe needs like 4x. Uh, when I was a professional trader in traditional markets, we had up to 4x leverage essentially on our on our equity. And even that was considered like kind of 
crazy, especially when you're trading options on top of that, of course, because, you know, it just gooses a little bit more, more, uh, more up. But uh, you have to realize that traditional markets, they're trading in very small percentages. Bitcoin can trade in multiple percentage points per day on like a on like a boring day. You know, we're just looking at it uh, over this past week, which is or sorry, over the over the past uh, two, three days, which Bitcoin's pretty much been in a straight line. But in that straight line, if you actually if you actually zoom in, there's about a four percent range right there when Bitcoin's pretty much asleep, you know, dur uh, during this uh, last little. Uh, and, and if someone's listening to this in the future, it was just a holiday, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day yesterday or sorry, two days ago. And so uh, not all that much action going on. So in my opinion, the le <laughs> the leverage is different because it's like it's it's just like uh, it's like a birthday cake that you don't need. But <laughs> you, know, you can just get fat off of it anyways. Charlie, what's your take about this? Do you uh, consider margin trading like an important part of your daily day, day to day trading activity? And uh, what's your take about the difference between uh, margin trading uh, Bitcoin and, uh, and general crypto and margin trading traditional types of assets? Yeah, I mean, as you know, I, I mostly trade FX products and futures products. But um, and so margin for me is important. Um, I don't have to take on a huge amount of margin. And we've seen in the FX markets over here in Europe with the new ESMA rules that uh, margin requirements have come right down. But they still offer a reason 30 times leverage. But um, that's fine in the FX world and the FX space. And I've always said to people, well, you know, you don't need 100 times or 300 times leverage, even in FX. And like Eric correctly said, you know, FX might move 0.3 of 1% in a day or half a percent in a day uh, on a decent day, whereas Bitcoin can move you know, in much bigger multiples. So people in the FX world might need a bit more margin requirement, but not still not 100 times, even though they're offered it. Um, and it's funny, you see people going to all sorts of different brokers all around the world just to get 300 times margin. You think, what are you doing? You'll never get your payout anyway, because they're probably in some weird jurisdiction and, you know, they're just a scam in many regards. But um, so margin is important for a lot of people. It just gives them a little bit more bang for their buck. If they've got $10,000 in a trading account, then at least they can get a little bit more bang for their buck on their trading. But when it comes to trading um uh, Bitcoin and the likes, then um, you don't need that. You don't need all of that extra margin. You've got a market which uh, swings around enough as it is. But I see this as exactly the same as I remember back in the 2010, 11, when the gold market was really frothy and everyone was trading gold back then because gold was super exciting and they were trading, trading gold on loads of margin. And of course, for periods, people, were, some people were making a lot of money. But of course, as soon as gold topped out in 2011, started coming back, um, people started having their hats handed to them. So um, as always, you have to respect margin and don't over leverage. If you over leverage, it's only going to be a matter of time before uh, you lose. That was a very cool discussion, guys. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, man, thanks for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, meeting Charlie over here and uh, massive amount of respect. Uh, very cool. Likewise. Yeah, really enjoyed it. And uh, good listen to your views there this morning as well, Eric. So uh, yeah, really interesting this morning. Thank you very much. Here with us today, Eric Crown and Charlie Burton. Thank you everyone for watching and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more exciting content. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe and hodl.